welcome to Adventuring for Knowledge. This is Adventure Call number one. Guess what? This is Adventure Call number two. And what comes after two, Manny? Is it three? Yep, you got it. It's Adventure Call number three. Last, Last call. call. Welcome to our podcast. It's Adventure Time. So we're live. And we are live. Sunday, uh, March the third. It and is. And we are here sitting with Ryan Conkering. Hello, everybody. Thank you so hey, much Ryan. for for coming in. Uh, Ryan lives in my building, so it was a really hard commute for you. Yeah, it was okay. I, I, I overcame the <laughs> the fourteen floors. Yeah, the, the weather. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're very excited to have you. And for those of you who don't know Ryan, Ryan Cochran is a retired Canadian competitive swimmer who specialized in freestyle distance events. And he's arguably the best swimmer Canada has ever had, hands down, in my opinion. He's got uh, bronze and silver medals in uh, Olympic Games in, Be- in Beijing 2008, is that right? Mm-hmm. And to 2012 in London. And he has a number of Pan Pacific gold medals as well as Commonwealth uh, game medals in the 400, 800, but your specialty is 1500 meters, right? Yeah, the easy one. The, the easy the one. The easy yeah. one. <laughs> Four years. I could barely run that. <laughs> so we are super stoked to have you. I'm sure you've heard this a lot of times, but we, the whole point of adventuring for knowledge is to have meaningful conversations with people and really get to know you. Mm-hmm. Really get to know your values, really get to know... Because we can you Google you and be like, okay, Ryan did this, 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 and this, <laughs> yeah. and this, and this. Okay, but who is Ryan? Yeah. Right? I so, guess I should know the answer to that, hey? Yeah, I, well, <laughs> we'll I should, find out here. I should also, because that's my next right. question. <laughs> so who are you? Yeah. So, we, yeah, so part our whole concept of the podcast of, before we re- started recording was just to have raw, raw conversation with each other and our guests and to get the best out of each other. And it's a component that we've we uh, implemented in our podcast at the end is we want to have you ask us some questions about ourselves. So how'd that brewing? Like, because right, you don't right. know this first time that we've all met each other. So yeah. like, who are we, right? You can probably Google me and be like, oh, he's <laughs> <laughs> Brody went to Oak Bay High School that it'll just stop there. <laughs> right, so where did you grow up? How old are you? Uh, what high school did you go to? I grew up in Victoria, yeah. uh, and I'm 30 years old. Yeah. I, uh, my whole family is here, and I always thought I would actually leave Victoria. Uh, I went to Claremont, graduated a year early, but decided that I should stay to, to swim. Um, happy I did, but at the same time, I never got that experience of living in another city. Yeah. Uh, but when you get into your 30s, I think you realize that it's, it's a pretty amazing place to be from. It is. And, and right now, I'm so torn because... I want to, I'm from Mexico originally and I want to go back to Mexico, but Victoria is so beautiful. Yeah. And it's just, I, I think the weather's great. The people are fantastic. I, you know, as a kid, it used to bother me where, uh, I felt like everybody knew your business. Uh, but then you quickly realize that that's really one of the most endearing pieces of the city is that there's always a one degree of separation and there's always that connection. So, uh, I think that's, it's, it's very encouraging to stay here because of that. Yeah. Totally. And I agree. I'm born and raised Victoria myself and I have faced that same dilemma as being everybody in your business and whatnot. But I actually did leave. And then when I realized, I was like, you know, I, like, I went to Oklahoma City. So I was like, mm, I think I want to go back and live in Victoria. What we were talking about before is we want to know more about Ryan. So your childhood in Victoria, were there any significant events that kind of shaped you or motivated you into the person that you are today? That's a good question. Uh, Uh, Any significant (laughs) events that you play over in your head is like, oh, this happened, but now I'm responding this way to do this. And this could be like in your first five years of your life, you know? I don't know if you remember. I was going to say to people, I thought it was usually after the age of four, but that might have been wrong. Yeah, maybe. uh, uh, You know, I was, oh, I am a twin, uh, and I think that shaped how I operated 
really from a young age. So my yeah. brother and I used to be very, very close up until our teens. Uh, but every time we would do a sport or anything, it, everything came easy to him. And, that, you know, and I'm sure it probably wasn't actually that easy, but he made it look easy. Did he suck at swimming and <laughs> yeah. go swimming? Well, swimming was the only thing I could do where he wasn't there. Oh, okay. so oh, it's, okay, right. I jumped at the chance to, to swim because everything else we did, it was like you'd be on a soccer team and he'd be the standout star. And the only reason mm-hmm. I'd be included is because my dad would be the coach and Devin would be on the team as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, I think it's the funniest thing looking back on that because you almost want your kids to learn that adversity so that yeah. they know how to overcome it. Because it's hard as a parent. You want to, you know, make sure your kid doesn't have to face any pain or torment or, you know, uh, failures. But that's what teaches you how to, you know, pick your pick your butt up and get going, right? Yeah, like learning so you, to expect and embrace adversity. Yeah, and, okay. and failure and know how to turn that into encouragement instead of failure as, you know, the end all because I think a lot of kids never really get you know, they never learn that failure and they live in a bubble. And, and, and then as soon as you reach that later in life, it's, you know, it's hard. incredibly hard to overcome that if you haven't done that for years. So, so you feel that you having a twin brother got you exposed to that failure fast and more earlier in your childhood do you think that played a key role in absolutely this? and and mostly because we were so similar that I was always, you know, you're always judging each other. Yeah, yeah, you're a twin. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, it's hard not to. And, uh, I, I, you know, I was very lucky to have that sibling that was the yeah. same age and we were so close for so long. But then you also want to have your own you know, separate identity. And I was lucky that my parents, we were never dressed the same. We always had oh, different that, classes. Yeah. Like it was just having a good sibling your age. Uh, but when it came to sports, it definitely was a motivator to try something, you know, different and to try get to get out of the shadow. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm thankful for that shadow because I think there's no way I would have accomplished what I did without learning that, yeah. you know, until the age of 10. So uh, you, you mentioned your parents uh, pushed you to do different things like soccer and then all of a sudden swimming landed. Do you, do you find yourself that you keep trying different things and then all of a sudden, boom, swimming? Or well, I was terrible at swimming. Sport? Yeah. <laughs> I was terrible when I started. Uh, and I, I did pretty much every sport you can think of. Uh, swimming was one of the things I landed on because as a kid, you just love that environment. I mean, it's the, like, it's fun, it's exciting, it's yeah. new. It's um, a Commonwealth pool. It was, awesome. yeah. You had, the wave pool, the diving boards, <laughs> yeah, the, everybody like, there. It's a child. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's an awesome place. And right? then you realize that if you're actually going to the swim club, like swimming, that you don't get to do any of that. <laughs> you're just, yeah. you're, in, you're the in the cold pool. pool. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, the sails was still there for sure. The, uh, But it, I just think it was something I, I wanted to do. And whether I excelled or not, I didn't really care. And I was fortunate I had parents that didn't also care if I excelled. I mean, I'm sure they wanted that, but never any pressure. You know, they're always invested without being pushy. And I think yeah. that's a very hard line for parents to Yeah, <laughs> to I walk. feel like I experienced that pushiness with my mom. Lots of people I, do, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. I tried going to Olympics in 2012 and it didn't work out. And I feel like the pushiness there. It's just some feeling that it's not you. It's not your soul that's wanting to do it. It's someone else's. Well, and it's hard to, if you do go through, you know, loss or or missteps, if you think you have to do it for somebody else, you're less invested in actually making it past that point. Right. Where if it's fully for yourself and you know you need to pick yourself up, stop feeling bad for yourself and move on. Right. If you know it's for you, then you will. Or if you think it's for somebody else, it's hard because, uh, you know, no parent, I think, does that you know, in a, in a negative, yeah, but exactly. it's hard not to, right? Like you want your kids to succeed and you want to support them and you want to be that invested. But sometimes being on the outside looking in is a better place to be. Totally. And that, that kind of is connected to my favorite question. I ask people is what is your why? And I don't want to ask you that yet, but that, that we'll somewhat, let them yeah, we'll let yeah. it through <laughs> because my, I like, I love listening to people's reasonings for doing things. Because I, both Manny and I, when we ref, we like to reflect a lot and we reflect on why we do things and we want to be able to have a like strong reasoning and belief in our actions and reasoning to go try to accomplish yeah. something. Right. 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 So when you were in high school, um, age 16, 17, is that, when did you notice that you were actually good at swimming? 
Well, I always thought I would be good. <laughs> I just yeah. wasn't good so when was, I started. So was your mind. <laughs> you know, my, one of the my favorite memories, I remember being in grade, I think, four. And it was like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And people were saying, like, lawyer, like, doctor. And I said, Olympian. And, I, again, I was terrible at every sport at this point. And I had just <laughs> but started swimming. But, but I wanted to go to the Olympics. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for 90 five 98 percent of kids they won't get that even the chance yeah. to try right. um and so I, I definitely am thankful for that and i look back on that thinking it could have gone sideways any which way up until the point where i actually was able to do that but it's like i had that goal and i had that dream and i, I the teacher asked you know in what sport and i said i have no idea <laughs> uh, you just know. i just knew that was the goal and uh and so I think, you know, by high school, I had some idea that I was progressing and I was lucky that I got a coach that really, or a lot of people around me saw what I could do. Um, but I also, I look back and there's times where I was told to be more like some of the people that were good at the time. Mm, okay. And it's funny because I was allowed to have my own way, but at the same time, you're supposed to emulate these other people because that's how you get better, right? It's right. like, if you're not good, <laughs> you try to do what the good people are doing. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny because those people were actually on the Olympic level or anything like that. But uh, it's funny who you look up to at different points in your life and, and how that influences you. So you did have that that person or that couple of group people that you yeah, like it's, to inspire? It, it, I never had heroes growing up, uh, which I think is also good if you want to go to the Olympics and you want to be that elite level athlete. It's, you know, appreciate what people do but don't put them on pedestals. And uh, a lot of the people who I grew up with, you know, they were the best in my events in the world and had the world record. But I was, you know, I wanted to get to the point where I was racing them and beating them and, and looking back on that, and, you know, favorably. That's right. a good way to put it. So acknowledge that they are good, but don't put them on a pedestal. Because that was yeah. one of our questions. So you just answered one of our questions. Like, who did you look up to? He's like, well, you didn't. Yeah. That's such a great answer because... <laughs> In order to be that elite athlete, like you said, you need to be have have that belief that you are on that pedestal. You are that elite athlete. You are as good or better than the people that you're competing against. Yeah. And yeah. having that mindset and approach. Yeah. I mean, to, I'm a bit of a realist, so right. you know, it's like that's where I wanted to be, and I wanted to be the best in the world. Uh, but I also knew that I wasn't there, <laughs> and so yet. Uh, yet, and so having that self belief that you can get there, but also being respectful of everyone around you. I mean, I wasn't one of the types of people who was the bravado athlete who like beat on my chest before I went up for my oh, race. Like, yeah, 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 like yeah. <laughs> and the, that works for some people yeah. and they really need that. And for me, I was more internalized and quiet, but I knew I was just, you know, instead of being outwardly loud, it was, you know, let your results show. Yeah. So when you were, cause I know when speaking to athletes, they, they write down goals. Yeah. Were you yep. vocal about your goals to anybody or did, were you very internal about your goals? Did you write them down and only keep them to yourself and spoke to certain people like your coach and maybe your teammates and your parents or how far did it reach out? Uh, when I first started, it was just myself. Uh, and then that extended to my coach by my first Olympic Games. Like yeah. We had the goal of winning in a medal there. Uh, but I did not want to share that with anybody because I didn't want to be asked about it. Yeah. You know, right. how's it going? What's going on? It's a like, huge burden. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. that's only because people care. But I think even, you know, friends and family, if I had told them, they would ask because they want you to do it and they want to be able to help. But in reality, that I think would have just driven me absolutely insane. Uh, and so just my coach and I, that was it. Um, I tried all the things like, you know, put the pictures of your competitors on the walls. So you right. can sneer at them every time you wake up or, you know, <laughs> write your affirmations every night or write down those goals. And right. uh, I, I think it's all beneficial in certain moments. Yeah. Um, but really for me, it was about building the right habits and habits is something I talk about all the time. But mm -hmm building those habits on a day to day so that, uh, when I got to the big moment, it wasn't like I had to, you know, be seeing fire to succeed. It was like, yeah. Nope, I've created those habits yeah. and I have these, you know, the few people that I'll actually talk about my goals to, they will keep me honest. Uh, but I didn't need it to be bigger than that. That yeah. said later in my career, I talked about my goals to everybody and really actually didn't accomplish any of them. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, but that happens. And I, I wanted to be able to talk about like winning and, and change how as Canadians we operate because, uh, we have many great athletes, but not a lot of athletes who are great at talking the talk and, and, and pushing that, you know, winning yeah. mentality forward. Cause we're so friendly and so polite as Canadians, right? Yeah. So that's, that's interesting to to hear because a lot of people are like pedestal like athletes oh i'm gonna be the world champion yep, this yep, and tell exactly. everybody right but i think i can relate to that i like to well i i changed so at first when i was younger i was oh, i want to be this i want to be this 
and I'm gonna do this. But then when I got closer to the goal, I started to scale back, you know, like, no, it's like, no, I'm <laughs> getting closer to my goal. I just want to internalize yeah. and focus more and create those habits and routines to be able to achieve. And I'm, yeah. and I'm curious, I want to ask this. So do you ever look, looked up or like you mentioned, don't put any, anyone on a pedestal? Did you put your, your brother on a pedestal when he was doing all the sports? So did you said, you know what? I acknowledge you're good, but I'm going to be better than you. I, you know, I don't think it was ever either or. Um, yeah. I wanted to succeed more than anything, but I never... There's only the odd moment I, I, that I faulted him for it, and it wasn't his fault. But uh, I have this vivid memory of doing cross country, and I tell the story all the time. But uh, they give me- uh, ribbons out to 50th place. So, right. And I remember I knew that. And I have these ribbons still, and it was like 47th, 49th, 50th, 49th. And I was like, like if hell freezes over, I'm getting a ribbon. I'm right. not getting 51. And then after that, it's just paper. Yeah, you don't get anything. It's so sad. Yeah. Like, why did, couldn't they just buy more ribbons? Like, uh, and, uh, and my brother was always in the top three, every single race. And I remember thinking, oh, I wish that was me. But I also knew that my goal was to try to progress off 50th yeah. <laughs> and yeah. maybe because it was far enough away that I knew I was never going to get first or third. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, you know, most of the time it was, I wish I could be better at what I was doing and I saw him being good at it, but it wasn't that it, it negatively influenced it me negative at all. Influence, yeah. So when, who pushed you over the limit with swimming? Who said, you know what, Ryan, you're actually good. Let's try and do BC games or nationals and then we'll take it from there. Uh, I think it, it definitely came from me because yeah. I knew once I started getting some success that that's what I needed to be doing. And I define myself by that success, especially at a young age. But I was lucky I had a, a, a coach I worked with for uh, almost 16 years, I guess. Wow. And uh, so he saw my ability when I was young uh, and he started coaching me when I was 12 around 12. Um, and so I was lucky to have a mentor who would push me And that's a, a young age, 12 years old. It's mm-hmm. not so much in swimming. Uh, well, it is in most sports, but I mean, a lot of Olympians in swimming are, a lot of the girls are 16. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of crazy to think about. Uh, nice. Gymnasts, yeah. like, the yeah. gymnasts, gold it's, medalists that are like 17. Yeah, if not younger. It's <laughs> yeah. not younger. It's, uh, it's a sport that you start young. So some sports, you know, like rowing is a great example where a lot yeah. of them start in high school. So a lot of the Olympians are into, well into their 30s, where uh, in swimming, I, I was quite old to be 28 in an Olympics. Uh, and so, yeah. Really? Which seems crazy because you're not that old. But was if you've been doing your, it for 20 years, right? Olympics? Well, that was my third. third your third Olympics. Yes. Yeah. How old were you in your first Olympics? I was 19 in my first games. Wow. So you, yeah. so you just graduated high school. And how was high school now that... Everyone knows that you were... Did anyone know that you were a swimmer in high school? Yep. Uh, I just would say high school was a bit rough for me because yeah. uh, I was always one foot in, one foot out. So I wasn't that invested in high school in general. I knew that I had to do well at it, but mm-hmm. I was more invested in where swimming would take me. And But also knowing, you know, you have to have a good balance. And uh, it's funny because a lot of the kids nowadays focus way too much on sports and not enough on school. And you're yeah. really doing yourself a disservice if right. that's the case. So you totally. do recommend staying in both. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you can. Like, I, I, you're yeah. able to succeed, and, or and, or you have to work a little harder, uh, but you're always able to. Uh, I think it can't be, you, you can't just let it slide. But uh, no, you're, it, you're totally able to. Yeah. So I'm a collegiate yeah. athlete myself, graduated and was successful in college, and just... It's a lot of work, yes, yep. yeah. but it's totally doable. Well, my, so when I got to university, I knew that swimming was number one, school was number two. So it took me seven years to graduate, uh, and I totally knew that. And I'd talk about that with anybody because who cares? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? like, you could always go to school. You can't always yeah. be a professional athlete. And so uh, I, 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 I applaud the people who can do it in four years and do well and do them both, but I just knew that that wasn't what my priorities were, and mm-hmm. I'm very happy with my choice. So I have a question. So... You said you're, you're really focused on habits and routines and tactics. What was the daily, what was the day in the life of Ryan Cochran at his peak? Well, it's funny to look back on that now because I am lucky to get a 90 minute workout in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we always had coaches and trainers and people telling us what to do. Right. So we never created our own programming. Okay. Um, quick day in the life was, you know, 45 minutes of dry land in the morning, a two and a half hour training session in the water um then usually an hour plus of weights and then uh the exact same thing at night uh so it was all encompassing and i think it sounds like a lot uh but for 
just to put it in perspective is, you know, when you start, you do two days a week and that, right in your first year, you're doing two days a week right. and then it's three days a week, five days a week. Then it's, you know, twice every five days. Like it's, it, it built over 10 years to get to where we were. Totally. Um, and it was a lot. I mean, the, we had Wednesdays and Sundays off. And at the time on Wednesdays, like you'd be so exhausted, you'd just be a hot mess, like for the whole, for the whole day off. Right. And you're trying to do school and all this other stuff that you're trying to manage. But in reality, uh, the habits were just getting to the pool and doing the workout. So I, we used to dread workouts. Yeah. There was certain workouts of the week. Tuesday night was one of our worst. And, uh, if I really thought about it enough, it would almost make me sick thinking of how hard it was going to be. <laughs> uh, but I just told myself, you know, you know, you always get through it. You never fail a set, even though it's really hard and that's how you push yourself. I don't right. think it's having to get like, as I said, like beat on your chest, like excited about everything. It's just the habit was put your head down, do the work and then see where it takes you. And I think that's a good kind of mantra for most of us. Cause a lot of us aren't the loud, boisterous people, yeah. but we can create the habits that can push you incredibly further than you ever thought you could do by just taking it one step at a time. So talking about mantras, when you get in, a, in the pool in a competition, do you have in your head or within an hour or even seconds before getting in the pool, do you have a mantra or do you have something that you keep telling yourself? Like you say, for example, you know what? This is what I'm meant to do, or I've trained for this, or I'm curious. I'm going to add on to that question as well. Did you have an alter ego that you switched <laughs> into prior? Because I know... I feel Matt, like I should have. Like, right? I did it, but I definitely, like, I'm like, maybe this would have made the difference. Right, because <laughs> Maddie and I are, are, we're pretty different to, like, we're pretty outgoing and goofy and relax on our day-to-day -day life but when we go into the professional environment we know how we know how to buckle down and get the job done and be professional yeah so that's yep. we can switch if that's like we have an alter ego to towards our to our work yeah yep. did you have an alter ego when you were competing uh you know i think as i said like i um i used to dread those certain workouts and i used to dread certain things and i used to complain a lot and i would always do the work and it probably wasn't good for the people around me sometimes but i would just like bitch and complain about everything right uh but like but then i'd put my head down and I'd go and do it and it just like it, it was cathartic to be able to complain about it uh yeah. and that's not how everybody operates for sure uh but i knew that when i got up to like even when you fly to somewhere for a competition by the time your feet on the ground it's like you know that it's go time and you're not going to be the one being like oh i'm so tired oh what if this goes wrong because yeah. there's always something that goes wrong um and the interesting thing about, say, the Olympics is it's all about the big, big successes and the big, big failures, right? And that's what people talk about. But in reality, there's a lot of people in between that. And those are the people who stuck to their guns, stuck to their habits, and had like a, a decent performance. And I think those are what probably most people could relate to. But it's not, it's sensationalized to hear about the, the big ups and downs. Right. And so, yeah. um, yeah, I think that's a, a bit of a disservice to everyone watching because there's so many storylines in there and yeah, there's, so there's just not much. enough time to tell them all, right? There's no. Uh, but yeah, I mean, going to a competition and having that like different mentality and like, what do you tell yourself? Um, I, we, I, my least favorite question was oh, people say, oh, your race is 15 minutes. Like you must sing in your head or like <laughs> you must be doing it. Like I, I'm like, I just find that a little disrespectful because I'm like, I'm <laughs> yeah, thinking I'm of like, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, like a yeah, thousand no, things to fix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, by that time, you're trying to you you've created those habits where hopefully you don't have to think about much technical. Yeah, you can really only think about two to three things technical the entire 15 minutes because you'll forget, you'll be tired, you're just trying to survive. Uh, but then it just comes down to racing, and so create those habits so technique is easy, and then race because that's what it's all about. Like right. that's when you dive in the water and you can see across that pool. Like that's why you do it. You're racing based on your instinct. You're already prepared, mm -hmm. and you need to trust your training yeah. prepared you for your race and you just need to go out there head down work and trust your instincts trust your preparation yeah and not think exactly much about it yeah. so talking so what i'm hearing is that it takes a lot of mental fitness and mental health to put your head down and isolate yourself did you how did you develop that mental strength or mental health to help you i think it's it's just the habits like it's, it's like you go to the habits. pool 10 times a week and you're going to do that for 20 years. <laughs> like you're going to eventually know how to push yourself past what you think is comfortable. Yeah. And you're going to know, uh, I mean, it's funny because at the end of my career, I started almost catastrophizing everything where I'd be like, this is your last chance to win that <laughs> Olympic gold medal. Like, like I remember 
<laughs> actually my first Olympics thinking like, well, like how many people are going to be watching this? So you're like, yeah. okay, so you're on TV and like your friends and family and there's probably like, I don't know, a couple thousand people in Victoria. And then you're like, and then like another couple million across Canada. <laughs> yeah. And then like, you know, like it's watched around the world. So there's yeah. probably another like 500 to 800 million people yeah. watching. Like, and you can drive yourself insane yeah. thinking about it's it. Like it's crazy. because, and then really it all comes down to like, how do you push yourself in that day in that race? And what I always found the most interesting is you're focused on all that noise before you go and you can get so nervous but then we were lucky because the minute you dive in the pool and I think it's the same even in like tracks a great example where with 100,000 people in the stadium it gets so loud it almost is like diving in the pool because you just can't even hear anything in right. particular yeah. and I think as soon as you get that almost silence or so much noise that it becomes like a, a constant Everything like of that goes out the window, and it becomes a, just a natural fight. Mm -hmm. and, that must uh, be so magical to hear all that in your head, and then all of a sudden you get so in the pool and you're submerged, <laughs> and it's like silent. It's all good, and then like halfway through, your body's just screaming in your <laughs> yeah, head, right? Like, why are you I, doing I, this? I really, run? I always <laughs> wish I was better at a, at a shorter event, and yeah. I'm sure everybody does. But just because my race is long enough that you knew, like it was, it might feel good the first uh, three or four minutes, but it was gonna hurt like hell. Uh, somewhere between six minutes and, and 12 minutes, yeah. <laughs> like it was gonna happen, and you're just like almost living in fear, knowing that like that's gonna come at some point. Yeah. Um, but that's what it's all about. If it was easy. You know, everybody would do it. So I have totally. one question. Only about, one? Well, a bunch. <laughs> yeah. but, right now, but right now I have one with regards to um, me, your meal plans and your food. When you became an Olympic athlete, I bet some a nutritionist was behind all of this. Yeah. And, yeah. and what was it? Well, we worked with a dietitian uh, for quite a few years. And when I first started, I said, write up a meal plan, tell me what to eat, what time of day, to the minute, and I'll do it. And that lasted like three weeks. <laughs> uh, because it just wasn't realistic. Yeah. When you're going to school, it's not realistic. And like if you're at home or you're lucky, you're you know in a major sport where people are cooking your meals all the time, mm -hmm. it's easy. But when you're cooking for yourself, and or even when I was living at home like as a kid, Trying to do that's not gonna happen, right? Yeah. yeah. And so to me, it was about, I knew, I just wanted to be educated on what was good. Yeah. Um, and then know that I'll fall and eat crap every once in a while. Like, that's the best way to describe it. It's like, almost, when I first started, it wasn't, you know, all healthy all the time. It was, if I can only eat junk food two days a week, do that. Okay. And then minimize it to one yeah. day a week, right? Yeah. And it's the same way. It's like making it manageable. I mean, sleep was a great example where... I would have loved to go out three hours extra every night. That just wasn't going to happen. So it's like, just try to go to bed five minutes earlier, like mm -hmm. once one week. And then the next week, go 10 minutes earlier, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, and that's so much more manageable. And you can create those habits where uh, like eating is hard because it's such a natural response. And it's so tied into our emotions that yeah. uh, like when you're tired and exhausted or angry or whatever that looks like, all you want to do is eat bad food. You don't want carrot sticks yeah. at that point, right? One, two liter tub of ice cream. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And luckily for us as athletes, we could eat especially swimming, eat anything almost and you'd yeah, still you'd be fit. All yeah. Right. Yeah. But I, I, by the end of my career, it's like, I didn't even have to think about what I was eating. I just knew that on a day to day it was healthy. Like just try to add more greens, try to take like sugars out. Like it's, right. it's all the things they talk about that are these big issue things that aren't really difficult to understand. Like before a competition, like the day before hours before, was there a certain foods that you, that not, you, not really. You know? So at the Olympics, they have, uh, different sections of food from different parts of the, of the world mm -hmm. and so I remember like my friend and I uh, would go for Indian food like the night before or like oh, any because okay. you're just all you want is good tasting food that you know is like a comfort but will be healthy kind of yeah, thing right like it's it, the Olympics yeah and it's yeah. exciting and, and like why not enjoy that right as well yeah yeah, that is totally. cool. yeah the worst thing we probably did is when I first probably when I was in my early 20s um, we used to take beetroot juice because mm, um, it's a natural yeah. vasodilator yeah uh, and so the but when we first started you had to drink a liter of it oh my god which is like disgusting yeah, and it's like the it's consistency of blood too yeah. <laughs> it's it was so gross and oh, so god. like i remember having to choke that down and it's just like i'm like it's for it's for it's for the gold medal <laughs> like, it is. For yeah. the good. oh god and so uh, by the end of our career they actually figured out how to make it like uh concentrated shots and so even just like shots of beet juice. yeah you're like that's not so bad when it's just like two tablespoons at that point <laughs> but it's like all those things you, you'll do anything if it gives yeah. you even a quarter of a quarter of a quarter of a percent because that's what we were working on like all the training you do all year is to try to take off a second in yeah. a 15 minute race and which, it's hard and it's really really hard <laughs> so you 
snowballing into that. Um, I know nowadays there's more science and more more studies with regards to a plant-based diet and how it helps endurance, like yourself, endurance athletes. Um, do you was this diet that you were following a plant-based, or did you incorporate meats into there? And what do you think about this new idea of a plant-based? Diet? I don't know enough about it. Uh, yeah. You know, I tried quite a few different. Uh, I guess eating ideals. Yeah. Uh, so we tried some intermittent fasting uh, for oh, for certain yeah. training I've sessions. Heard so mm-hmm. much about that. Yeah. Problem with that is you cannot do hard practices by intermittent fasting. It has to be an easier practice. Yeah. Right, you're just gonna pass out. It's just you need the energy. Yeah. Like there's just no way. Um, and I was really fortunate. I was working with professionals who did the research and I trusted them, right? Like I didn't have enough time for this. I was trying to write papers on stupid psychological things that I don't remember (laughs) really using my degree. Um, But the, and then uh, I did go gluten-free for a year and a half just to try it because there was some studies that showed that might help. Didn't, I didn't feel any different. Um, To me, it always ended up being, am I getting enough caloric intake for what I'm doing? Which is, I guess, a good problem to have. Yeah, (laughs) Uh, it's the best problem. Right? The most interesting was before the Olympics, uh, I could eat almost anything I wanted. And it's amazing what nerves can do to your body because I lost 10, 12 pounds uh, in like the week leading up to the games. Uh, And your training stayed the same. Absolutely same. It actually dropped down because you're going into competition. Yeah, and so it's just amazing that that can be like it can affect your body so like all encompassing. And so I remember our dietitian was just trying to give me. I had to eat like 14 meals a day, and and then eating is just a chore, right? But it's but you're you're dealing with those nerves, and that's one way that you know it can take it out on your body. So on race day, sorry, man. So on race day, how much did you eat, and how long before your races did you eat? Like caloric intake. Yeah. I tried to eat as much as I could and still feel comfortable, I guess, right. because I just knew that I was like, I don't want to get halfway through my race and be like lacking energy. Right. Like, that's the last thing you want. And so uh, you probably eat more than you need to those days, but mm-hmm. you just, it's, it's. Even on, even on race day? Yeah. Yeah. And so when would you cut yourself out, say four hours, three hours? I. Uh, Two to three hours. Two to three. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, and it's just, uh, we also took caffeine and, and some other supplements mm-hmm. uh, that was legal for us to take. And so you have to eat with those or else you feel yeah. gross. And yeah. So it's all like managing. But again, it was practice. Like we do that every major competition and you, you make sure you find like the exact timeline that works for you. And totally. we were down to the minute of when you'd want to be out of your warm up like before you race right. and what oh, was okay, the magic yeah. number um, and that was all thrown off we had suits uh, for a span of a couple of years while I was an athlete that took like 45 minutes to put on but we oh, would normally man. in an full ideal world body, only be 30 minutes suits. so oh yeah those are the good days yeah. like, <laughs> something was easier with those <laughs> our super I suits um, so I am very curious with regards to when you go and you win a medal um, does the Canadian government put a lot of emphasis economically to re, to repay you back for that medal? So do we get paid? Is what you're asking. Yeah, how much did you make? <laughs> that was the most polite way. I didn't know how to do it. See, we're trying not to be invasive. Like Now we're being like, pass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know? And I'm very curious about it. Yeah, so yeah. Olymp- Olympic medals, they reward. Um, and then I was part of the Own the Podium program, uh, which right. we have in Canada. And so that started in the 2010 games, or into the 2010 games to... Uh, I guess the whole mandate is they can't give everyone funding is the idea, yeah, which is, exactly. it's funny because Canadians would love to give everyone funding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? But that was, if you were, especially a top three performer um, in the previous years, you would fund and get like a certain chunk of money. And so okay. my group, we were all lucky because I performed every year and then we had people coming in and out of the program. But so we got funding every single year for us to go on trips, to nice. pay some of our staff, all that kind of stuff, which costs a lot of money because oh, yeah. we had eight full-time staff and their entire job was just to make sure that we were the best Perfect. athletes yeah, we could be. Which you think like, even if they're being paid minimum wage, which they weren't, but it was probably close to that. Uh, it, that's just a lot of time and energy that's just on us. And, uh, mm-hmm. but when it comes to, yeah, so Olympics, they reward medals. Um, and then world championships, not so much. So mm-hmm. we rely on, uh, our, the money we get from the, the federal government every month and then private sponsors. Yeah. It's all about the sponsors. That's right. all about the sponsors, man. Yeah. yeah. What, what were you? What were your sponsors? Uh, I had quite a few over the years. Uh, yeah, everything just, from RBC yeah. to Price Waterhouse, uh, Speedo. Uh, you know, it's there was a lot, a lot in there, and I was very lucky. Um, but it's it's also very hard as an, as a 
quote unquote amateur athlete in Canada because uh, you know you're not a hockey player and you're not getting the same viewership and so having yeah. to create your value is is difficult but not not, not unheard of. It's hard, yeah. If specifically swimming, well, swimming is pretty big in Canada. Do you think it is? It's especially supportive. actually in the last couple of years, uh, it, but people are getting more on board. But it's very, it's always a bit short sighted where you know people get excited around the Olympics, which is fantastic. Yeah. But the years in between, it's just not as interesting. Which it's still like uh, swimming is still better than a lot of sports. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's not because it's not televised. Because it's not presented to us all the time, so we just forget about it. It's the power it. Yeah. of the media. It's the me- yeah. it's media, right? There's not that platform. So, so when it's leading up to Olympics, it's... Yeah, high, 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 it's right? the storyline around in the Olympics that I think right. people like. Yeah. Uh, the problem with swimming is it's not really that interesting to watch. <laughs> Although people would probably say the same it. thing we about other sports. It, I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's just, it is, if you're not invested and you don't know much about the sport, it is a lot of just back and forth, back and forth. But then if you watch soccer... A lot of the time, it's just back and forth, back and forth, right. too, right? Like, and I guess every major sport is, but if you don't know it, it's it's a bit of a harder sell. Right. But if you can sell the storylines around right. the people, um, which they've done a better job with, because we have yeah. very interesting athletes, <laughs> uh, it, it'll make it better for everyone, I think. Cool. Do you have any books, psychology, or uh, sports psychology books that you refer to, or did you go see a sports psychologist during? Yeah, I had. Throughout? I didn't have any books. Um, I found I would read the books, and then I wasn't that invested, and then it would just be out the other year, right. three weeks later. Right. Uh, but I did work with uh, three sports psychologists over the years, and then also just a regular psychologist because okay. I found I got something different from each of them, and I think everybody should go talk to a psychologist or a counselor or you know whatever that looks like for you. Mm-hmm. I, it was like I could talk in front of a mirror if I didn't think it was so weird and probably get the same result because <laughs> yeah. a lot of the time they're just giving you references so that you can get to the answer on your own, right? Yeah. They're not they're not going to tell you how to live your life or what's the best answer for you, mm-hmm. but it's so much less weird talking to somebody and just going through the motions of it, uh, which, and if a lot of, lots of us, that's our significant other or that, that's, you know, friends and family, but it, I liked how it was, it was private, it was somebody who... I could just totally unload on and they would yeah. understand. Uh, and then I also, yeah, I got different things in different people. So I worked with many over the years, many at the same time yeah. because everyone has different things that you can relate to them on. Yeah. And you can get so much knowledge and you can lead to so many different paths by talking to different people. Yeah. And it's, it's just amazing to me that that's not more valued in our culture. Yeah. Um, it's, I feel like it's a stigma almost. Absolutely. Right. It's like, you know what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're crazy if you go to a psychologist. Yeah, yeah. It's and so I, I always I, I'm an advocate for it because I think it, everyone would be happier if they had a professional to talk to. Yeah. Because also, like, even if your, you know, your friends or family are talking about something, uh, half the time I have to be like, I, I can give you advice, but like, I don't think I'm the right person to give you advice yeah. on, even though we're friends. But we almost feel in, um, entitled is not the right word, but we feel like we we have to yeah. help our friends by having the answer for them. And sometimes the answer is just pivoting and saying, maybe you need to talk to you know Sorry. somebody who can help you more than I can. So you prefer talking to a professional. You didn't have a friend or a family member that you can always... Uh, I had lots of, like, to. all my friends were swimmers. I shouldn't yeah. say all, but a majority of them, because that's who yeah. you see mm-hmm. nine times that out of ten. That was your life. Yeah. 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 Social <laughs> life. Has exactly. Out the door. And it so you talk about swimming stuff to them, but the problem is, is I was going after a goal that wasn't as relatable oh, with okay. other people, and maybe that was me feeling a bit elitist. Uh, but I was like, I want to have this goal with somebody who actually will probably tell me off if I'm being ridiculous and yeah. your friends are always trying to you know cushion around that and just try to make you better where right. sometimes you need some hard tough love <laughs> and you need I think the professionals are willing to tell you that where your friends maybe do but not with the same tact and right. uh, it's it's a bit of a worse off balance that way yeah that is so interesting because I I want to start going to a psychologist but I also find myself writing and journaling being that that helpful for me. Did yeah. you find that? Yeah. Did well, you journal? Uh, I, again, another thing I started and didn't finish. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but I do, I think that's absolutely true. Like I, uh, I think it's, again, it's like talking from a mirror, right? Like yeah. you're just, you're writing it down, you're thinking about it. And then when you put it into words, you're actually responsible to it a bit more. Mm-hmm. And then you, you, when you start writing it, you're like, that does sound ridiculous. I am being ridiculous. Or like, that was something that really set me off. And, and I think like, whatever that looks like to you, I think it's, it's it can be yeah. very, very, Helpful. It can be so many different things. Yeah, totally. So I got a question. Were there days that you wanted to quit? 
Ah, uh, well, oh, that's a good question. There's also there's days where I didn't know if I could go on. Uh, days that I thought I could quit, not really. Um, by the end of my career, I really didn't enjoy racing that much. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't enjoy training that much because it was always hard. Right. <laughs> but it was habitual to go to the pool every day, ten minutes yeah. a week, right? Like exactly. I did that way more than racing, and I didn't like the feeling of dread going into a race and, and everyone gets that. Like you always get butterfly in your stomach, whatever you want to call it. But, mm-hmm. uh, I just, I dreaded how much my races were going to hurt. <laughs> and, yeah, Cause and, you knew it was like, well, yeah, <laughs> like they just so, always did. <laughs> so how long was it? You said 15 minutes. Yeah. So my main race was 15 minutes. That's a long time. That's a long time. Yeah. It, it's funny. Cause in reality, it's not like in the grand scheme of things, yeah, it's not 15, like yeah. people can hold their breath for 15 minutes, which I think is the craziest thing. Yeah, I yeah, can't hold my breath ridiculous. for 30 seconds, but, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's 15 minutes. In, like you, you don't, can't even think like 50, you can sit in front of the TV for three hours and yeah, you exactly. don't think about it. Right. Exactly. And so 15 minutes, isn't that long, but when you're almost a hundred percent turned up, uh, you can feel everything, you can hear everything. Like you're, you're that in the moment. It feels like an eternity. Oh, yeah. yeah. I bet. Yeah just overflowed with lactic acid well that's the yeah the six to ten minutes that, that's where, it <laughs> that's where the bird yeah. went yeah so throughout your your olympic career what do you value the most um if you were to rank your your values with regards to going to the pool every day getting a healthy sleep talking to my friends and family do you can you list your values? And did it change? Did it ever change throughout at, as each stage of your career? I don't think it changed that much. I think I valued being an athlete. I, I later in my career, I was more thankful to uh, be an athlete uh, and actually, you know, you realize at a certain point that instead of being jaded and bitter and just wanting it all for yourself, yeah. you realize that you're pretty freaking lucky to do that as a job. Uh, and when you're totally. 18, you don't appreciate that. When you're 28, you really appreciate mm-hmm. that. Um, and there's not any real jobs in the world where you're not a hundred percent focused on yourself. Um, Cause most of us have like friends, family th- commitments, things that you're pulled away from where if you're an athlete, you can justify doing nothing except being an athlete. (laughs) Um, And so I think that was always valued high. Um, I always valued my friends and family. I didn't value uh, any real extracurricular times. Like I had no hobbies, I had no time for that because all I did was, if I wasn't competing, sleeping or eating, I was hanging out with friends and it wasn't very noteworthy, but that was always valued to me as those connections with the people around me. probably hanging out with your friends at the pool. We tried to get away from the pool as much as we oh, could, okay, but yeah, <laughs> we still had, we still had fun with it. Yeah. It, I was very, very lucky to have, uh, really great people around me. And I think swimming is a sport that attracts like-minded people. Yes. It's also a so sport mm-hmm. you, because you start young and you do it throughout high school. It's like, you really can't get into any trouble, uh, where other sports, like it's way easier to be a bit of a like crappy kid right. <laughs> where swimming, you're just too tired to do that. Yeah. You're too tired to get in trouble. You're too tired to, to go out on the weekend. And, like, and it's an individual sport too, unless you do a relay, it's for people, but it's mainly an individual sport which i loved uh honestly i was selfish and wanted all the success and all the failures just for myself Mm -hmm. um and i guess more along the lines of i wanted all the success but i knew that all the failures would be on me as well exactly (laughs) and self self self-reliant yeah you didn't have to rely on anybody else for failures or success it all just came from yourself yep and you do have that team around you and those people are there every day at training and you couldn't do it without them but i love the idea when you dive into race it's like there's none no external things happening other than the people you're racing yeah. but it's just like what are you going to do today not oh i hope my teammates do well today like i i, I hope <laughs> that but yeah. it was like i, I wasn't tied to that but not right? too well yeah, yeah. <laughs> so talking about failures what do you think failures that really stuck with you or are you the kind of person like failure happens move past through it learn from it and can you how did you deal with failures? Or, yeah. or a tough one was what? It, it's a tough one to answer. What was your biggest failure? Yeah, that's a tough one always yeah. to answer. The it's interesting looking back on it now because I am very happy with my life now that sport is done. And so I look back on sport as a chapter and, um, I was lucky. I think I found that quicker than a lot of athletes. It can take years and to reevaluate yourself and then just get a sense of self, Mm -hmm. uh, is really difficult for myself. I look back on it. And so I, I, I could, I'll list a couple, but in reality, I I still look fondly on the whole thing. Uh, but I think if you focus on the the negatives too much, it can drive you absolutely insane. And the what ifs are always there. Um, you can't go on No. It's done. Yeah. yeah. But my worst one was my first Olympics. Uh, I got third, but my time from getting third 
or sorry, my time from a prelims would have won gold medal. And I couldn't see the guy in the outside lane. And I look back on that and it really took me probably eight years to come to terms with it was my first Olympics and there was a lot of things moving yeah, and changing and definitely. going that are totally out of your control. Right. But if I had put together a slightly better race, I think my life from that first Olympics on would have been completely changed. Um, the worst though was my, uh, I missed the, my, I have two events at the Olympics, the 400 and the 1500. Mm-hmm. The 400, I missed my first Olympics by uh, three one-hundredths of a second. Oh, I missed the final. But I also had an okay swim there where I was like, you know what? It was the best time. Can't be mad about that. But I was I was ninth. Uh, and then it happened again in London. Uh, and it was one one-hundredth of a second. Uh, and then somebody dove in then got disqualified then got brought back in and it was just a bit of a mess oh i remember uh, that yeah i remember watching that and so i had to wait until way later in the day and i remember just being livid because uh my coach made me go to our team meeting that night and i was like uh, the last thing i want to do is be like rah rah about our finals tonight and when i have to watch an event like i'm right. kicking myself that it happened again right um and then it happened again. <laughs> uh, I was I was actually 10th or 11th. I don't even know what my result was, but I missed it by a 10th of a second at my third Olympics. Mm-hmm. And so, and the amount of times I practiced that, like, hit the wall as hard as you can, like that last little bit, because that makes a difference of hundreds of a second. Mm-hmm. I mean, hundreds yeah. of a second is so small. Um, but you kind of have to laugh after the third time. <laughs> like, you're yeah. like, what are you going to do, yeah. right? Yeah, it wasn't meant it, to be. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I, but the you have to, like, I saw him day one, day seven. So... I had to, like, you could feel bad for yourself. I gave myself one day, and you feel crappy because you're, like, especially in Rio, I was like, I will never, ever, 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 ever get this chance again mm-hmm. to try to, like, right this wrong. And you prepared yeah. for years. 20 years. Yeah, and, uh, and it, like, and it's so close that, like, it just didn't ever seem to be in my favor. Mm-hmm. But, like, wake up the next morning, and you're like, too the bad. Day. Stop yeah. being bad for yourself. Like, stop feeling bad for yourself. And, you know, like, move on because at least you have another chance. And I remember even thinking that after I was very disappointed by my results at my last Olympics, and I knew I was going to retire after that. Uh, but it's kind of one of those things you're like, well, like, I, what will doing b- bad do for me, right? Like, yeah. I, it's like I feel disgusting. I feel gross. I feel revolted by mm-hmm. how this ended up. But also, like, what can you do about it now? Like, you can look back. I think when you're an athlete, you're always trying to move on to the next thing. So you'd have a bad competition, and you'd say, okay, what went wrong? Triage it, move on, make it better for next year. Yeah. And that cycle was just year after year after year after year. And it's, it was always in a year, right? Like, it was, even in the four-year cycle, there was always something to measure yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes down to it, it's like, no, it's never going to be perfect, and there's always going to be things to fix. And you, I don't know, it just, it's pretty frustrating when you think about, like, how... Find these details. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's such an awesome answer because Manny and I could relate to us. Just adversity, expecting and embracing adversity, and what you do next is what really matters. Like we had a podcast that got scrapped. Like, okay, we need to act on it now. Like, what are we gonna do? Is the next day? So, okay, we're gonna record an episode about facing adversity and explaining the situation, and we're gonna record this episode and release the next day. It's not trying to win an Olympic gold medal, so to say, but it's that same thinking of, okay, that's done. We need to prepare and go to the next step to be able to yeah. achieve it's, what we're... The, ba- the, goal. the balance is hard because you need to care. Mm-hmm. You have to care enough that it, it means something to you. And when you move on, it also, you, you can't forget what happened, right? So yeah. uh, in my experience, I had to forget because I'm like, that's not going to help me to ever memorize it all, right? Just like move on, deal with it in a week. And it's funny because after the Olympics, you know, you say, oh, I'll deal with it in a week. And then you never think about it again, yeah. <laughs> right? Like it's yeah. like, well, like it's, you know, Until you, now. you moved on to other things. <laughs> right. and, but then, yeah, yeah, I look back right now and I'm like, yeah, I wish things could be different, but at least I was still ninth in the world. Right. <laughs> exactly. And at least I was yeah. still had that experience. And 100%. I was, I think, so focused at the time on success as a measure of uh, myself that you forget. You're like, but do people actually care? Mm -hmm. And like, so what are you looking for? Fame, money, fortune? Like, what does that look like for you? And I'm like, yes, I still want all those things. (laughs) But also, how do I make that connection with people around me? And that probably means as much as a million dollars, if not much more. I think this is a perfect time to ask the question. Oh, yes. Our favorite question. Uh, Our favorite question is like, why? Why swimming? Why that ambition at 12 years old in school? Why the Olympics? Why sacrificing social 
other avenues, car- other careers? Why? But, and it's so hard to answer this question because it's, it really comes from your soul. It's like you really have to take a look at your life and say, you know what? What was the burning thing in my ass that was yeah. just... Well, I think it's mine has changed dramatically. So yeah, when I was awesome. a kid, uh, the why was how do I stand out? How do I be better than everyone else? I wanted that fame, fortune, all of it. Because <laughs> most kids do, right? Like they want to. It's like when you it's ask the them, image. Yeah, and that was my why as well with soccer. I wanted that image. I wanted to have that that the look. Yeah. Right. And I think that morphed, uh, that always was a a measure and it was always what pushed me a little bit, uh, but that morphed into being, you know, I made this goal, I want to see it through. Uh, And so later on in my career, you know, I wanted to be able to stand on the podium and I wanted to do that for everybody else, but I mostly wanted to do that for myself to show that I could have, Mm -hmm. that I could accomplish it. Uh, And yeah, a couple years later, looking back on it, I'm like, but did that, did I really care? Like, it's almost like you get so invested in these goals that you forget what the whole point was in the first place, right? Exactly. Or, you know, what else is out there? And I, Mm -hmm. I think about my job now where I've actually been trying to think about that when I think of goal setting and what I want to do as a real estate agent. And, um, I think of the why, because I am passionate about what I'm doing. It's like, I like the day to day. It's like, there's all these positives. I like working with the people I work with, mm-hmm. but the why, uh, I think is a bit invasive, or invasive, not invasive. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> maybe this question's invasive, yeah. <laughs> no. uh, yeah. but it's evasive because I, I think it changes by the day. Some days it's like, yeah. I want to, uh, change people's minds about me. I want to show people, you know, I kind of, I always will have a chip on my shoulder of like trying to like show people how good I am mm-hmm. because I don't think that people see me for how I want them to see me, mm-hmm. um, which is a good motivator, but it's also kind of ridiculous because you, you're thinking a little too much of yourself yeah, <laughs> and exactly. you're thinking people are thinking about you too much, right? <laughs> yeah. That just uh, drives you nuts sometimes. <laughs> but a lot of us, I think, can relate to that where you're just like, yeah. I want people to see me in the most positive light. And But I, yeah, my job now, it's like, I want to make the biggest difference. And I think that means for myself, for the people around me, uh, for the industry, all those things. And mm-hmm. I want to affect change and be a change maker on a daily basis. So, Good answer. Yeah, so what do you do now, now that you're talking about it? Uh, I, I sell real estate. <laughs> do you it's, still work out? Do you still work out long I try. I stay? try to stay fit. It's, right. uh, it's, it's funny. It, well, it's hard when your hours are all over the place. And yeah, so, especially as a real estate agent. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, we need this, we need that. And you have yeah. to develop that relationship. Well, that's one of my favorite parts of the job, where you're bouncing around all over the place, no day's the same. Um, people have requests that throw you through a loop all the time, and okay, you're like, great. At o'clock at night sometimes. Well, I try not to answer my phone okay, after okay, 10, yeah, because okay, nothing good is probably going to happen. Night. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, yeah, I do try to work out every day, every morning if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a lot of athletes fall into another sport or mm-hmm. like reevaluating yeah. themselves through uh, exercise. Mm-hmm. I am not that type of athlete at all. <laughs> I'm like, I would like to be fit, but I don't really need this. Like to be in the league. Yeah. yeah. I think I find competition in my work. Uh, and yes. so I always need competition, but it just doesn't need to be through mm-hmm. sports. Probably because I'm so bad at other sports. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. like, ah, if I'm going to start from the bottom, it may as well be something that pays me. <laughs> Do you swim still? No. Nope. Uh, my, Done. my younger brother, uh, Liam, is five years younger, and he swam as well. Um, but I, we were on a family trip last year in Hawaii, and we're like, you know what? Like, let's go to the pool. It's beautiful. It's Hawaii. It's outside. Yeah. I dreaded it every moment until we got there. And we, we, we do a couple kilometers, and I'm like, Liam, I really don't like this. And he's like, me neither. Like, he's like, why are we here? Like, got out, never went back. And uh, That is so funny. It's so weird to think you do something as much as you did, and then right. you're like, no, it's not no. I'm good. So, yeah, yeah. I'm out. To the next challenge. And they're always there's always time to go back yeah, uh, right. I think it's just it's too fresh and it's too like yeah. I'm like I don't want to train 10 times a week like, yeah, I, I, I want to do something else and uh, it's it always amazes me people who do their job like my dad's been doing his job for 40 years he's a mechanic mm-hmm. and I'm like 40 years is a long time oh you hear God, people in their careers so for 50 55 years and our generation is just not like that. Like we, I think I agree. access to information, you know, you're able to research, find other jobs that are out there and move around a lot. And we just have different expectations. Right. And I, and I, I truly connect with that because I feel that if you are working on a job and you do not feel challenged, like you probably feel a very challenged being a real estate agent and it always. keeps you on the toes yeah. and every day always is changing. different, right? Yeah. So like you say, your, your why changes throughout the day. Okay. This is my why today. And like you said, in this generation, it's imperative that if you feel stuck, if you feel challenged, or if you don't feel challenged, 
switch yeah make the switch right. and that's what you did and put everything in the past in yeah. the past it's just another chapter in your book yeah. i really like that <laughs> i really connect with that and i think our generation we don't retain information as much anymore either because it's all at our fingertips right we don't need to that's a really good point yeah. we, we don't need to retain we can just ask the man up above google <laughs> google right like yeah. hey what's this right we don't need to it's no stuff there's such it a sucks. it's good between you know if you do a job for decades yeah you are a master at your craft yes. and you're you know exactly what you're doing it's an impressive wealth of knowledge you can rely on that all the time and you can be great um but that's just not for everybody, right? And yeah. a lot of, it's like, I, I find some people always get like the five year itch and they're always changing mm-hmm. every five years. Mm-hmm. And I think people uh, demonize that a little bit. And they're like, well, if you just stayed, you'd probably be higher position and yeah. better off. But if that's not making you happy, why do it? And so I think if you know how to ask yourself, am I happy? Am I satisfied? And you can say yes. Who cares if you do a job for 50 years or five years or five months? So it's mm-hmm. if you're unhappy, I mean, not all jobs are great. <laughs> and like, and you know, there's parts of my job which are just painful at the best of times. Yeah. But you know, overall, can you say life is good? And right. Then you're in the right path. Right. And so, I think athletes have a. We're better at reflecting at that and saying, acknowledging, and we have because we we're in tune to our bodies. You're an athlete, obviously. Manuel is an athlete. I'm an athlete. We're in tune to our every aspect of our body and we can reflect easier i think can reflect easier in that i think we can reflect easier because we have the time and the allowance to do so right you know most people are pulled in every direction they have kids they have job they they have mortgage payments they have you know like you don't really ever get to ask yourself am i happy doing this job you're like (laughs) are we going to make payments next month it's a very different question yeah Uh, and so in a perfect world we'd all find that happiness and i think we're all a lot of us are just on different points of that journey yeah totally so different points here your journey talking about kids are you, do you want to start a family do you have a partner I don't I'm single uh, there you go, yeah, 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 exactly <laughs> I have two nieces and that's the best because I yeah. don't have any responsibilities mm-hmm. uh, but I, I I've been telling anybody who asks I'm like I love my nieces and I turned into one of those crazy stage moms who has like 7,000 photos on my phone uh, and it's funny because I don't I wasn't really a big kid like person and yep. it's amazing how family can change you yeah. totally to keep fit, do you what is what do you do now that you don't swim? Uh, I try to bike, I try to run, I try to go to the gym and do a mixture of them all because I get bored pretty easily. Nice. But what gym do you go to? Uh, good life. Good life. Yeah. I like it. I love running because I like we got to go to some amazing places, yeah. um, but it, the what you were looking at never changed. It was always the same back line, and sometimes it was tiled, sometimes it wasn't. Uh, right. And so I love running outside, and I do some of the same routes all the time, but they're always changing and different times of year. And I, I just yeah. we live in a great place in Victoria where you can run all year round, and uh, it's it's a new passion. I just wish my body could yeah. <laughs> handle it yeah. more than two or three times a week. Yeah, totally. I'm starting to run too. And I feel like when I when I run, I can get in my head more, and I take the time to reflect. You yes. know, like what it's, am medi- I it's do? meditative. Uh, it most is. of us don't take the minutes a day to meditate, and even just I actually tried to do that when I quit swimming. Uh, is like give yourself 10 minutes a day and fall asleep every single time. Uh, and you're like, well, that's not really like meditating if you're asleep. And so I find running is, is very calming and meditative. And right. it gives you that, it f- forces you to, to do that for yeah. minutes a day. Mm-hmm. Being you a competitive person, uh, do you think you'll take running into a competitive, maybe just like a 10K or like I do man. 10Ks and stuff all the time just because yeah. I think they're fun and yeah. to be in that environment. But I usually run with people who are a bit slower than me and mm-hmm. friends and family. And yeah. uh, I run with my mom every once in a while. And she's a decent runner, but it's just for fun. Like it's right. like they, you can socialize. Yeah. It's, an, it's an event. I don't think I'll ever do it to train. Like even no. training a half marathon doesn't really interest me. Yeah. I, I, I still, you know, it's not enough hours in the day, I think. Yeah. Okay. So so I, we have a next question for you. So we have an idea for creating this race. It's gonna. Well, we don't know how large it's gonna get, or if it's gonna get or it, if it's or like five or, years or, from now. Yeah, you know, or, or even if it's feasible, just based on are we able to provincial run a race in provincial parks? But we want to do a race the one if you could trail. Would you be interested in doing something like that? How far is that? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that Should like a lie? five? Should isn't that a five day? Thing? Yeah. 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 It's it, 47K. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. I would love to do it, and yeah. I love being able to get out in Victoria and on the island because it's be we're so lucky. Marshall. 
Maybe. Yeah. That sounds yeah. much more there, my alley. Yeah. yeah. At the end, say, hey, well done. No, we should. I could fire the start gun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll be good, I'll be good at that go. for sure. <laughs> fire the start gun. There you go. Man. That's awesome. We have one question here that uh, it's very interesting and. I find myself wanting to ask myself this question, but I'm not old enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's, uh, what advice would you give your, your 20 year old, or like you said, when you started swimming, your 12 year old, and what advice or questions would you give you yourself when you're 40 or when you're 50? Mm, that's a good, I mean, we always got asked the question, yeah, what would you tell yourself at 10 years old? Right. They love yeah. asking athletes that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have an easy answer. It's just uh, when you're a kid, you believe you can accomplish anything. And then the further and further you get into your career, you start, self-doubt starts to creep in. And so, you yeah. know, I got second over and over and over and over and over again. And I remember thinking at one point in my early 20s, I'm like, well, maybe this is it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I was like, I've been second like more times than I can count. Um, and it, I look back on it now and I'm like, but that was great, right? And there was different people in first almost every time. Yeah, <laughs> which awesome. is, uh, yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> you got to laugh, I guess. Um, but I wish I kept that self-belief and that self-motivation from when I was young, or more self-belief, yeah. um, because I think that can carry you so far if you mm -hmm. don't lose that. Uh, looking forward, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the future will bring. Like no, I, it's a, it's I, I think, question. I think fifty-year-old me will be able to tell thirty-year-old me, you know, the world. But I think looking the other way, it's it's, it's really hard. hard. Yeah, yeah. The, because I don't know what I'll be doing at fifty. No? I could you don't do the exact same. Doing anything? I could. I I have no idea. It's it's funny. I think I. It's not that I didn't picture living until late in life, but I have no idea what me at forty or me at fifty or me at seventy looks like. Some people can really see it. Yeah. Um, I have no idea. I, I like think my answer would be prepare yourself for anything. Just be yeah. able to, to have that mindset to be open-minded that anything could happen from... I was going to say, I like the idea of being open-minded because right. prepare yourself for everything seems a bit futile. They, yeah, what, it's just so yeah. much. What, what are you preparing for? But if, right. you, if you're open to any experience, mm -hmm. I think that's... I would totally agree with that because mm -hmm. you never know where life will take you. The amount of people who... Uh, I know who started one job, switched that, moved states, moved cities, like are doing something completely different, have never been happier. Right. You're like, if you had said no to these opportunities, where would you be? Like, he, and so I think just saying being a yes person because mm -hmm. we all get stuck in a little bubble all the time, and I do this the worst. And uh, if you could do exciting things that are a bit outside that realm, you'll surprise yourself, meet new people, do new things, yeah. and be way more wealthy in experiences. Mm. So new exp trying adventuring for knowledge. There you go. There you exactly. go. Oh, it came back around. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> adventuring for for knowledge on different experiences. I I like that idea. And That's I like what, wealth. And when you and I'm. Thinking wealth, no wealth of knowledge and experience, not wealth financially. I mean, if we can well, have I it mean, all, that'd yeah, be great. I mean, that's nice, I mean, that's nice too. Yeah. But, but overall, wealth and well-being, yeah. which is a big part of your wealth, and most important part of your wealth is just your physical well-being, mental well, well. Yeah. What's your happiness scale? What's totally. your happiness scale? Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. Any more? Any questions, buddy? So I, I, I'm. I'm any questions from you to us? Yeah, that that's, that, that was the next question. Now that you've gone to yeah. meet us a little bit more. Have a little conversation, meet our quirky selves. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know, I think biggest question is where do you see this going? And especially for listeners, what, what value do you think you'll give to them? And then what do you yeah. hope to succeed with? Um, I was reflecting on this today mm -hmm. because I, I went for a, for a hike and... I got to the top of the hike and I looked at the beautiful nature and I was like, you know what? What am I doing with this podcast? Yeah. You know, like I have a, a job, an office job, comfortable job, pays well, pays the bills. And I found myself that starting this podcast in order to make me uncomfortable. And that's great. Mm -hmm. Making me uncomfortable and trying to talk to as many people to gain as much knowledge for myself and to share with everyone out there. And in my mentality, I don't really, at this point in the podcast, I don't really care how big or how, how much audience it gets. I just care that the people that we are impacting, I would like them for them to impact as much as possible, like close family members, like my mother, for example, and my sister. Future kids. Future children, like one, I want my future children to have this bucket of knowledge from all these people and say, you know what? 
I can take something from that person mm -hmm. or I can take something from another person. And I find that this podcast is allowing me to get ideas of where to go in life. Mm -hmm. Of like, <clears throat> what, is, what is next for me? Giving me ideologies of, I like the way this person thinks, you know? Or, I've never thought of this. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. trying to experience new things on this. So, mm -hmm. and I love spending time with Brody. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> I like it. It's existential. So, yeah. So, my answer to that question is a little more simpler than that. Is not going forward is not forgetting why we started it, not forgetting yes, where we came is... from. So, you, yeah, we gain a large audience. Great. But that's not what we're doing. That's not our why. Our why was because this is a creative. Uh, some, something creative that Manuel and I get to do two, what else, four times this week, uh, once or twice a week to get together and do something together and then share it with people and give knowledge, hopefully useful knowledge to our family and friends and whoever wants to listen and not get away from that and not have the potential size sh reshape our why. At the same time, I feel like I want people who are listening to this podcast to dig deep into their mm -hmm. their why, dig deep into their soul, dig deep into their reflection self and say, okay, maybe if I write things down or maybe if I reflect on certain aspects of my life, I can be better. Yeah. Maybe if I eliminate judgment and eliminate the external factors that affected me, maybe I can be a better person. We want to be a, a catalyst for change in people. And I feel like I already heard a lot of th good things from my mother, and it makes me so happy yeah. <laughs> that I'm making a change. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Do yep. you find yep. that when uh, people, when they hear your talk, or and they come up to you and say, "Wow, you motivated me so much." Uh, you know, I it's it's always very humbling to hear that. Um, but I always wonder. I'm like, what does that look like? Like, did, like did that? Did they follow through? Like, what's you know? Like, you don't get a lot of feedback loop from yeah, people right. that you meet. But I think if anybody can take one or two things and just try to do better for themselves, mm -hmm. you're creating that positive change. Mm -hmm. It's a trickle down effect. And like, you know, it's it's whether people listen to um, podcasts on a daily basis or they hear something once and they decide, okay, maybe I need to be more positive. Maybe yes. I need to have better habits around sleep or eating or, you know, whatever that looks like. And mm -hmm. um, I always laugh because I've tried to train um, my, my parents, especially my mom, because <laughs> she she's a bit of a worrier. Like she's a classic like mom. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, and I think worry is really bad for your health. And I think you should be consciously an activist or things, but you shouldn't always be worrying about it. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to instill a bit of like training <laughs> and people always laugh when I say training, but I think people need to, as I said, feedback loop, they need to hear, maybe you should stop doing that. Like I had a coach that told me that all the time yeah. and the average person does not have a coach that's like talking in their ear all the time. And so it helps to have it like on your phone, set reminders for yourself, you know, once a week being like, are you worrying too much today? Are you being a stressful yeah. driver? Uh, like, can you affect change? My biggest thing nowadays is can I affect change? And if the answer is no, then should I be worried about it? Probably not. Like, and, or think of a workaround and if there's no workaround, then just keep on moving forward. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I have all these reminders in my phone that just pop up every once in a while. Half the time I swipe and never read them, <laughs> but the few times that I do and they, they remind me to, to correct myself. It's like yeah. having that inner coach who just reminds you once or twice a week. So you attentively coach yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, well, I, I feel that way about anybody. If I have a problem with somebody, I will tell them. Or if I find something that somebody's doing annoying or I think like they're doing a disservice to themselves I'll, in a nice way, I'll, I'll give them the feedback. Because a lot of us will be like, oh, that person complains way too much. Or that person is the worst to work beside because uh, they pick their nails at their desk or something. Like yeah. whatever that looks like, it doesn't matter. It could be the most mundane thing. But if, you're, if you actually say, hey, do you mind not doing that? Most of us are just talk about it and then won't actually yeah, take the step so to actually say, you know, let's find a, a, a fix to this. So uh, I, I really do believe that you can affect change if you don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I feel very passionate with regards to change, like mentioned before. And this podcast will have a lot of episodes that will inspire change, that will inspire um, thinking more about yourself, the planet, the animals. How can we make change Amazing. for future generations? Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank uh, you so really much, Ryan. I, yeah. I hope thanks you have fun. Thanks for taking your time to come talk to two random guys on a podcast. Absolutely. This started, awesome, with, this started right? with an email. Like, I, 
I sent you in the elevator a couple of times. And tell him the story about the elevator and how you st stood yeah. in the elevator. So, my <laughs> wife and I were at the elevator, <laughs> and I was, and I previously told my wife, Hope, I want to enter <laughs> to have a recording session with Ryan, and then all of a sudden you walk in the oh in God. the room. Right? People would love this. Yeah. Like, lots of people believe in positive affirmations, yeah. and I get it. But I'm a bit of a pessimist. It's crazy. But things like that happen, and you're like, ah, you literally, the world. Yeah. You literally <laughs> walked in the front door, and we were already the doors closing <laughs> in the elevator. So I actively put my hand in the elevator, and I waited for you. And of course, you had to go get your mail. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah, the and positive then, affirmation worked, but like, you really had to work for it. Exactly. Yeah. So we went in there for like 30 seconds to a minute. And then it was getting close to the time where the elevator started screaming, like, come on, it's time to go. Yeah. And then you came, and then we talked. And, and just like that face to face conversation, I feel like when I send you the emails, hey, did you relate it that face, that friendly smile? I, I always appreciate I just, I thrive of passionate people. And mm -hmm. so I think uh, if people, I was just saying, people are, that are prepared and passionate, it's like you guys, you, you make people want to help you and then mm -hmm. want to be a part of what you're doing mm -hmm. and just keep going with it. Totally. Well, thank you. That's awesome. Good to hear. If Thanks, you, man. I have one more question. No, really? If you were to describe <laughs> yourself right now in one word, what would it be? I only get one word. You only yeah, get one, one word. word. I would say passionate, but that just seems like a cop out because <laughs> I can't just get out, right? Um, I don't know. I, how, how do you describe That's yourself in one words. word? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. That's the closest like, we're going to get. I feel like passionate. Well, if when you're when you're doing things, do you feel very passionate doing them? Like you're doing with all your heart? Do you feel like Not always. No. Uh, I'm not a person who is like turned up to a hundred percent all the time. Like I, I don't think you have to be hot headed and loud and excited all the time to be passionate. I'm more of a subdued passionate, but yeah, um, I think that's what drives me every day. For well, maybe next time when we have you in the podcast, you have a word. There you go. I'll, I'll be thinking about it for months. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. And if you, uh, if you hear this episode and you feel motivated, please leave a comment. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and our website at VenturingForKnowledge.com. And you can find Ryan, your real estate, here in locally in Victoria. Yeah, where can we find you? RyanCochran.ca. RyanCochran.ca, <laughs> there you That's go. That's the liner. Yeah, and you have the agency, right? That's your... Uh, I do, yeah. Great company. Great yeah. company, yeah. there you go. I'm in good company, at a great company. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you so much for everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. See ya. And please remember to be active in your community. <laughs> Brody, come on. <laughs> Remember, remember to keep smile. Going, keep going. Remember, to, remember, to, remember to smile. Remember to be kind and respect yourself, others, animals, and a beautiful planet. And please, never stop adventuring for knowledge. Until next time. Peace.